I'm making an effort to share my screen. If I've never been very good at it. Can anyone see what I've got up here? Yes. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. Okay. Well, thank you all for letting me uh, do this. I always find it tough. I know there's some newer members of the Board of Adjustment, some that have been on for a while. I'm not sure that I've done a training seminar for the Board of Adjustment, but I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to you tonight, just to kind of give you, a, for most of you, a refresher course on why you are who you are and what you're doing there. <laughs> Um, I want to start a little bit first by kind of talking about the big picture of things in the city. Uh, first, with the introduction of a little bit of basic vocabulary. Um, land use law, obviously, is where the board adjustment falls in terms of the grand scheme of what the city does and its police powers and its operations. And obviously, that generically applies to regulatory activities governing physical planning and land development. So that can include sign control, architectural review, historic preservation, subdivision controls, wow. environmental regulations. Those are all fall within the general concept of land use law. And in the city, the key players in the city's land use law enforcement and regulations uh, are the city council, planning and zoning commission, you as the board of adjustment, and then of course, the Department of Planning, uh, the Department of Public Works and some other city team members also participate, uh, but I think in a slightly lesser extent than the Department of Planning. I always like to start, whenever I'm talking about land use law or zoning, I like to start with this principle. Up until 1926, zoning in the United States was deemed to be unconstitutional. And I like to start with that premise, uh, and, and I, I put up here Euclidean zoning, and I'm going to make a, a embarrassing admission to you all. When I first started practicing zoning law, I heard the phrase Euclidean zoning, and it usually was mentioned by engineers who I always associate with math and geometric shapes. So when I heard Euclidean zoning, I thought, well, there must be math involved so and geometry, so I guess that makes a certain amount of sense. Well, in fact, Euclidean zoning is named after the village of Euclid, Ohio, which was the United States Supreme Court case that first upheld a zoning regulation in the United States, saying that their regulation was, in fact, constitutional. And Euclidean zoning is our general zoning scheme and the general zoning scheme of most cities where you have a continuum of zoning regulation depend, based upon intensity of use and density. So industrial at one far end and agricultural at the other, or park at the other far end and residential and commercial in between on that continuum. And I bring that up also because as specifically applied to Missouri, courts have recognized uh, and, and I like this, this quote, one of the primary rules of construction in this state is that zoning ordinances being in derogation of common law property rights. Think about that phrase for a second. Being in derogation of common law property rights, because that's ultimately what the city is always dealing with whenever we're talking about a zoning regulation. That is property rights, constitutionally protected right to have property. Uh, and the law says that whenever ambiguous, should be strictly construed in favor of the property owner. Now, this is just intended as kind of the broad grand scheme of things. Now, with regard to specific zoning in Missouri also, there's a general principle in municipal law known as Dillon's Rule. And what Dillon's Rule says is, Missouri cities have or can exercise only such powers as are conferred by express or implied provisions of law their charters being a grant and not a limitation of power, subject to strict construction with doubtful powers resolved against the city. It is a general and undisputed proposition of law that municipal corporation possesses and can exercise the following powers and no others. Those granted and express words, those necessarily or fairly implied in or incident to the powers expressly granted, 
those essential to the declared objects and purposes of the corporation, not simply convenient, but indispensable. Well, what does that mean in layman's terms? Well, what that means in layman's terms is if a city does not have some law that says we can do something, we can't do it. So a statute or the constitution have to, or the city's charter has to say the city can exercise this authority. And if it doesn't say that, the city can't do it. So where are we? Why is this important to us? Well, let me give you an example. Many of you are probably familiar with Lincoln County. Uh, Lincoln County being an agency of the state has no zoning authority. They don't zone. So if you live in unincorporated Lincoln County, you have no zoning in Lincoln County. Why? Because the law says they have to have an election to have zoning. And by God, the great citizens of Lincoln County have said over and over again in elections, we don't want zoning, so we're not going to have it. And the county commission up there has no other authority to enact zoning but for voter approval. Now, in terms of the city of Wildwood specifically, we obviously are a charter city. The city's charter, specifically section 2.1, provides that the city shall have all powers which the General Assembly of the state of Missouri has authority to confer upon any city. So it's a very broad grant of authority, which generally says, if the state can give it to a city and the state does in fact give it to a city, then the city can exercise that authority. So it's a very broad grant of authority. And a zoning ordinance, is an exercise of the state's police power. That's an important thing to recognize. This is the state's police power, in essence, being delegated to the cities. Uh, and any exercise of such delegated power must conform to the terms of the statutory grant. So we get to, okay, so what is the statutory grant? That is chapter 89, which is also known as the Zoning Enabling Act. This is the chapter in Missouri law that it grants to cities the ability to zone property and enact zoning regulations. So, I mean, it expressly says you can't, you know, a city can uh, uh, impose regulations on the height of building, setbacks, uh, adopt a comprehensive plan, establish a street plan. And frankly, the appointment of the Board of Adjustment is also an express statutory grant. Now, to the contrary to that, it does not grant, doesn't prohibit, but it doesn't grant authority to impose zoning as to location within a district on a church or place of religious worship. And for that reason, the courts have interpreted that to mean that cities can't zone churches because that grant of authority has not been given by the state. Now, the importance, now let's get, so that's, that's the grand scheme of things in short. Talking specifically about the Board of Adjustment, your role and the fact that you exist is absolutely critical and imperative to the city being able to have zoning regulations. Chapter 89, the Zoning Enabling Act, says that a city shall provide for and appoint a board of adjustment. In fact, Missouri Supreme Court in 1936 said, if you don't have a board of adjustment, you don't have zoning. So if the city did not have a board of adjustment, its zoning regulations would be void and completely unenforceable. So your existence, <laughs> much less what you do in your position, is critical to the city's ability to have zoning regulation. And I, I like this quote from that case, that Supreme Court case, which was Kramer v. Schwartz. It says the provisions of the Enabling Act, specifically the provision that requires the appointment of a Board of Adjustment, 
are material and substantial requirements intended to safeguard the property owners, the public, and the municipality against injustice, error, and precipitate or, or ill-advised action by local legislative bodies or administrative officers are mandatory in character and that compliance with these requirements is essential to validity of any zoning ordinance. So your role is to protect against injustice and error, or I, I like this one, ill-advised actions of my local legislative bodies. Luckily, we don't ever have those situations in the city of Wildwood. So let's talk a little bit about the framework of the Board of Adjustment, because I, I don't want to, this cannot be overstated enough. The Board of Adjustment is the most unique body in any city. I want to say that again, you are the most unique body in any city for a couple of reasons. One, the Board of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial body. You are the only quasi-judicial body in the city. What, what, what does that mean? Well, it means that you act more like a court than anyone else in the city, whether it be the Planning and Zoning Commission or the City Council. You are a quasi-judicial body by the nature of your existence. And you are authorized to determine and vary the application of zoning regulations in harmony with their general purpose and intent. I wanna kind of give a real life example because I actually had a training seminar for another board of adjustment earlier this week. And a question was raised about, or a comment was made regarding overruling a decision of a planning and zoning commission where they told me, I don't like overruling what the planning and zoning commission did. That's not fair that we have to do that. And my response to that was, but that is the entire purpose of your existence. The Board of Adjust Adjustments purpose for existence is to adjudicate and judge a number of things, some of which are, and we'll get into this in more detail, to overrule administrative decisions that are believed to be made in error and to get, grant variances. And what are variances? Variances are exceptions to the general law. So the city council has enacted legislation saying, here are our zoning regulations. And every time you grant a variance, you are saying, we are giving an exception to this piece of zoning legislation. So you are essentially overruling the city council's legislation. Now, think of this again in that constitutional context that we're talking about and why zoning was considered to be unconstitutional until 1926. Your goal here is to protect property owners from general regulations, which as a whole are a very good idea, but under certain circumstances might be onerous. And we'll talk about that specifically as we get through the very types of variances. So again, the Board of Adjustment, while you're not, you are a quasi-judicial body, you're not held to the same standards as a court of law, but again, you more closely resemble that format than any other local governmental body. You are the only body, you notice at all of your meetings, you have a court reporter at your meetings. You are the only body that is statutorily required to have a court reporter at your meetings. And why? Just like a court, they want a transcript of the proceedings. Uh, the Board of Adjustment is also to be autonomous and independent from all other boards and councils. Statutorily, you have the authority to establish your own procedures and rules consistent with statute. And the reason for that is, is you are intended to be completely autonomous from other boards and councils of the city. Uh, and the matters that you consider, you hear and decide only and solely on the record before you. All right, well, what does that mean on the record before us? Well, that means based upon the evidence that's presented to you. There's a reason Joe Vunich at the beginning of every meeting introduces the city code and specific chapters of the city code into the record before the hearings. That's because he is entering that evidence into the record. 
If that evidence is not in the record, we may have to do it again if there's a, a court case. There's a there's a court case, and I'm, I'm blanking, I believe it was Drury, it was a billboard case where there was a variance. The variance was denied, but the ordinance that was being varied from, so the ordinance that had the regulation for which they were asking the variance was never entered into the record before the Board of Adjustment. Now, Board of Adjustment had read it, they knew what it said, but it was never entered in, as part of the record. And when the applicant went to file suit to challenge the denial of the variance, the court said, the ordinance isn't part of the record. We can't make a decision because we don't know what the ordinance says. And they sent it back and made the Board of Adjustment do it all over again. So your decision has to be made based on what's on the record. That's the testimony and evidence presented. And that is sworn testimony. That's why we swear people in. Like in a court proceeding, you raise your hand and you swear to God what your testimony is. And, you, and that record then, if there's a court case, if someone challenges your decision, that's what goes to the court and that's what they see. Uh, well, we'll talk a little bit about evidence and, and, and all that in a little bit. So generally speaking, the Board of Adjustment has three, there are three authorized actions. Variances, which I'm gonna separate into two types of variances. Use variances, which are basically the you allowing someone to use land in a manner not permitted in the zoning district. So meaning, you know, we've got permitted uses and conditional uses in each zoning district. A use variance is a use that doesn't fall within either one of those. And they're requesting to use their land in a manner that is not either a permitted or conditional use in that zoning district. The second are area variances. Area variances, which is what you more commonly see, are deviations from restrictions on the construction or placement of buildings and other structures. That's your setback variances or uh, encroachment into preservation areas or, or resource protection areas. Those are area variances. And then appeals. Appeals are, some, there's a belief that someone made a mistake, some administrative officer, whether it be someone in the Department of Planning or someone somewhere along the line made an administrative decision that was in error regarding zoning, then they want to appeal it to you for a decision. So first, use variances. Now, in terms of use variances, it should be noted that the general rule is that use variances, well, any variance really, should be exercised exceedingly sparingly and only under exceptional circumstances. And when it comes to use variances, especially so, 99.9% uh, .9 of use variance requests should just as a matter of rule be denied. Because uh, this is truly someone saying, I want to, you know, I, have, I am in the non-urban district and I want to operate a restaurant in a, you know, a fast food restaurant. That would be a use variance. Saying I want to use this property for something that's not permitted under the zoning code. Now, one thing that's important is that it is the burden of the applicant to show that strict enforcement of zoning regulation would cause unnecessary hardship. And that's the standard, unnecessary hardship for a use variance. Um, and they have to prove it. There, has, there need be no opposition to it, no facts contrary. If they don't prove it to you that they have met the standard for an unnecessary hardship, you don't have to grant it. And the court's generally going to find in your favor if it's challenged. So what's an unnecessary hardship? Well. These are generally accepted standards for what an unnecessary hardship are. Property owner is deprived of all, not some, all beneficial use of the property or would incur unwarranted economic hardship 
and achieving a permitted use. So basically, they effectively can't use the property for any permitted use in the zoning district. The conditions causing the hardship are unique and pe peculiar to the applicant's property, as opposed to being caused by the applicant has to be unique to the property. The proposed variance will not destroy the preservation of the city's comprehensive zoning plan. So it has to be in harmony with the area and with the comprehensive plan. The use proposed must be specific and must be a use that is allowed as a permitted use in at least one other zoning district in the city. So they can't just come up with some use that's generally prohibited in the city. They have to request a specific use and it has to be one that is identified as a permitted use in another zoning district in the city. And then the applicant must establish that the granting of a use variance would result in substantial justice for all. And again, I didn't mean to do that. Think about it again in the context of the constitutional issue is that, you know, has the regulation, there's a, such, there's a thing called a regulatory taking. We all are familiar with the concept of taking like an eminent domain where there's a physical change in the ownership of property as a taking. But there's also a regulatory taking. A regulatory taking in the constitutional context is where a law that the city passes effectively takes away the use of a property from an individual. And the idea here is, is if the regulation is such that it affects a regulatory taking whereby the property is effectively useless, that may be a basis for the grant of a use variance. So the other type of variance is an area variance, interesting. My slides are different than what I saved. Um, so to obtain an area variance, the petitioner must establish practical difficulty. So we had unnecessary hardships for a use variance, practical difficulties for an area variance. The practical difficulty standard is slightly less rigorous than the unnecessary hardship standard imposed for use variances. So it is a lower standard. It's easier to obtain and easier to prove than a use variance. Uh, the standard for a grant of a variance generally refers to some unique physical attribute of the property, not conditions personal to the owner. And that's an important thing. And I, I've seen it before this body and I've seen it before other boards of adjustment where someone comes up and says, well, I need a variance because it'll make it work better, or I need a variance because I already put it up and I'm asking forgiveness, not permission, or I need a variance because I just need a bigger X because that's what I want. From a legal perspective, practical difficulties is not based upon the conditions personal to the owner, but based upon the physical attributes of the property. Now there's no precise definition of practical difficulties. However, uh, courts have, and I'm gonna skip ahead and then I'll jump back. Uh, the courts have considered the following factors in determining uh, what is or is not a practical difficulty. One, how substantial the variation is in relation to the requirement. So how, what's the size of the variance, in other words? How much are we talking about? If you're doing a setback, vari variance on a, a, a setback, are you going into the setback six inches or 20 feet? The other is the effect of the variance, if the variance is loud, of the increased population density thus produced on available governmental facilities. So fire, water, garbage, and the like. So if they're allowed to, let's say, have a smaller lot, 
than would otherwise be allowed. Is that going to have an impact on city utilities and resources? The next is whether a substantial change will be produced in the character of the neighborhood or substantial detriment to adjoining properties created. So effectively, what's the effect on the neighbors or on the neighborhood? Now, I will say this to you. Oftentimes, you will have residents who are opposed to their neighbors getting a variance, which is fine, perfectly acceptable. They have as much of a property right to defend the value of their property as the applicant in the variance has to request the variance. However, one thing that I see a lot is sentiment. Sentiment is not evidence. So if you get a, uh, uh, a the word is escaping me, a petition, an opposition, and it just says we oppose, that really has no evidentiary basis for, for anything. It just says they oppose it. The fact that someone opposes isn't relevant. It's what they oppose and why they oppose it, that is. So when someone comes up and says, I don't want this to happen because I believe it will, it's inconsistent with the neighboring properties. It will cause a detriment to the neighborhood because you're taking down more trees than are to be preserved in other lots and we appreciate our trees or uh, it's gonna, deteriorate the aesthetic value of the subdivision by allowing this change from the zoning regulations uh, and what impact it and reduced property values. Those are all rational, reasonable reasons and acceptable reasons. Next is whether the difficulty can be obviated by some method. I, I will say, I didn't make up these words. These are all from court, so I don't typically use the word obviated in my normal speech. I'm citing court case law. But um, whether the difficulty can be obviated by some method feasible for the applicant to pursue other than a variance. So are there other options other than getting a variance? Uh, what's the common response to, yeah, there is, but it's more expensive, right? We hear that a lot. It's a lot more expensive. It's just cheaper if you give me the variance. Well, that may or may not be the best answer. It may be, depending upon how much we're talking about and the size of the variance and the reasons behind it. And next, whether in view of the manners in which the difficulty arose and considering all of the above factors, the interests of justice will be served by allowing the variance. Are you protecting the property rights of the applicant and the neighboring property owners? Is the ordinance as applied in its totality to a certain extent unreasonable as applied to this specific property because of the unique nature and unique attributes of that piece of property? John, can I ask a question? Yes. Should, actually, should we wait our, for our questions till the end or should we just ask as we go? Um, why, why don't we wait till the end if you don't mind? Uh, that way I can get through it because I want to make sure I get, make sure you guys get the break and I get through everything. Perfect. Thank that's you. Okay. Sure. And I, I am coming, getting close to the end here because I did reserve some time for questions at the end, including the break. So the next item, so we've talked about use variances, we've talked about area variances. The next is appeals. And again, these are appeals from the interpretation of administrative officials in the enforcement of the zoning regulations. So someone disagrees with a determination from the Department of Planning. They've been denied some permit or something. Well, that means you file an appeal to the Board of Adjustment and ask the Board of Adjustment to overrule the decision by the Department of Planning. So what are the hearings or what are the procedures for the Board of Adjustment? Now it's worth noting that the procedures are statutory. 
generally speaking. Now, in terms of like adoption of Robert's rules, how you elect your chair, those are all up to you all. But the procedures for the variances are by and large statutory. And here's what they require. First, a hearing is held before the Board of Adjustment after public notice, as well as due notice to the parties in interest. A couple of things to point out in this statement. And again, this is statutory. One, it's a hearing, not a public hearing. Well, what, what's the difference? Again, you're a quasi-judicial body. Think of it like court. If anyone's been in court, which I hope none of you have, but if anyone's been in court, you know that while you may have an audience sitting in the courtroom, they're all not allowed to come up and talk. Only the parties are allowed to talk, right? So this is a hearing, not a public hearing. Now, as a practical matter, what's the difference? As a practical matter, there's not a whole lot of difference because A, the parties are gonna to get to participate. B, you'll solicit witness testimony from anyone who wants to give it. And that's perfectly acceptable and fine. And it's a good thing to do. But the big distinction between a hearing and a public hearing, again, is you're not there to listen to sentiment. You're there to listen to facts. Someone coming up and saying, I don't want it, don't do it, and then sitting down is not a fact. That is their opinion. If they say, don't do it because diminution of property values, because of aesthetic reasons, yada, yada, those you can accept as facts. The other part is public notice. You know, we're, we're, everyone typically follows the notice requirements for like a rezoning, which is a 15 day published notice. Statute doesn't require it for the Board of Adjustment. The notice that's required is a notice to the public, which one court has said posting the notice on the property is sufficient, uh, and then notice to the parties, which would could be affected by mail, which is all of which the city does and is perfectly acceptable. But it is different than the hearings before the Planning and Zoning Commission and the hearings before the City Council. And the processes and the notices are also at least statutorily different. While we may use the same procedure statutorily, they are intended to be different. Not that what anything is being done is incorrect. I just think it's important, it is important to re recognize that again, you are a quasi-judicial body and these are for the presentation of evidence. Next, the concurring vote of four members of the board shall be necessary to reverse any order, requirement, decision or determination of any administrative official or to decide in favor of the applicant on any matter upon which it is required to pass under any such ordinance or to affect any variation in such ordinance. So every vote you take as a board of adjustment requires, if you're going to approve something, it requires or overrule. If you're going to overrule a administrative decision or you're going to grant a variance, it requires four votes every time. Why? Statute requires it. And then finally, all testimony, objections thereto, and rulings thereon shall be taken down by a reporter employed by the board for that purpose. So again, you have a court reporter at your meetings. And the reason you have a court reporter at your meetings is because by law, you have to. Statute requires it. All right, so at the end of all that, you've had your hearing, you've conducted your testimony has been provided, evidence has been presented. What's, what can the Board of Adjustment do? The Board can reverse or affirm. So you're gonna reverse the administrative decision or affirm the administrative decision, wholly or partly. You may modify the order. So it doesn't have to be in the whole, it can be modified. You can make the decision that you want. Modify the order requirement, decision, or determination appealed from, and may make such order requirement or determination as ought to be made, and to that end shall have all the power of the officer from whom the appeal is taken. So you have the authority 
Oh, so if, the, if there's an appeal from the Department of Planning, upon an appeal, you have the authority of the Department of Planning. Same with a variance. You have the authority to grant, as you commonly do, impose conditions. Uh, and that's all because you have the express statutory authority to do that. And finally, I want to make a note about judicial review. So any action taken by the Board of Adjustment is appealable uh, to the St. Louis County Circuit Court. Now, this is a good thing for not only the city, but also the applicant who's requesting a variance if it was granted. Uh, all petitions challenging one, a decision of the Board of Adjustment must be filed with the court within 30 days after the filing of the decision in the office of the board. So once you issue your decision, 30 days to appeal it to the circuit court, that's a pretty short period of time when you consider other uh, basis for challenges to city decisions, 30 days to file that appeal. I've actually been in situations defending cities and their boards of adjustment where we filed motions to dismiss because the petitions were not timely filed. Uh, and the court will review, first of all, they review it on the record. So the record that's created at the Board of Adjustments so or the transcript of the proceedings and the evidence presented, that's what goes to the court. Now a court can say, yeah, well, we wanna hear some additional testimony, but generally speaking, they're gonna review your record. And this is, this is also an important thing is that a court's gonna review that record made by the Board of Adjustment in a light most favorable to the board's decision. So a court's going to basically say, I'm gonna give as a general principle, the Board of Adjustment's gonna get the benefit of the doubt in any challenge. And all things being equal, they're gonna defer to your decision uh, unless there is clear uh, and concise evidence that you acted in error. So that's, that's well, you can ignore that, but uh, that's the presentation, and I'm happy to open it up to any questions. Well, I, I had one real quick here. Um, first of all, thanks, John, for doing that. That was pretty interesting background. Um, my first question, I have two. First question is real easy. Uh, there's a lot of content there, like, I, man, a lot. Is there any way that you... Yeah, yeah. Is there any way that you could just like PDF that presentation and and you know email it to those of us who'd be interested? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. And then the second the second thing is you know on some of the slides, particularly I think it was in the uh, I hope I hope we don't have a test here, but anyway the area use yes uh, or area area variance. Um, I think it was on the third bullet. You know, it talked about you know whether there would be like a substantial impact on the neighborhood or something like that. I, I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, still using to me, I call them kind of fuzzy words, like what does substantial mean? I mean, and, and I think that's a lot of what this board sometimes wrestles with is, you know, what's really that hardship. I know there's a few guidelines, but man, that's, that's to me, that's the really tough part of this thing. No, and you're absolutely right. And the answer to your question is there is no one clean and definitive answer. Uh, that's ultimately why there is a board of adjustment is the idea that you got to have four people that decide that there is not a substantial change that will be produced in character of the neighborhood. Uh, and if four people can't agree to that, then there would be one. That's ultimately, that's ultimately it. Uh, so it is a factor that is intentionally somewhat ambiguous that you all have to make a determination and that's why a court will defer to your judgment more often than not on in that determination and again you know in terms of variances by and large challenges to variance requests at least the denial of variance requests are rarely overturned okay all right thank you i was actually hoping for something a little more concrete but that's okay <laughs> that's all right i get it i get it Okay. Hey, hey, John. We question. We hear a, a lot. Um, this would set a bad precedent, or this isn't the precedent that we want in Wildwood, and so forth. Can you speak? I, I've heard you explain it, and, and you do it well. Can you speak to why we shouldn't 
overly be concerned with precedent and, and, and basically this is exactly what our job is to do, you know, by definition being a variance. Right. It comes down to really that one factor that we talked about, and that is, um, let, me, let me pull that up here. Uh, it, not the factor, but the fact that variances and the concept behind a variance is based upon the unique, the, the practical difficulties that are because of a unique physical attribute of the property. So the concept behind that is and as a legal principle, every property is deemed to be unique. So zoning regulations by their nature have to actually per the Missouri constitution have to be uniform and per the Missouri, the Zoning Enabling Act have to be uniform in their application. So all properties in the NU district have to be treated the same. So the zoning laws have to be equal in that district. All regulations in the uh, residential have to be equal in their application. Um, so to grant, give a, a variance from that equal application of law to where you're varying from it has to be based upon a unique physical attribute of the property. And that entire concept is, is premised upon the idea that each property is unique and this piece of property is even more so unique to where it would be a practical difficulty to apply the general zoning regulations to it. And the property owner, again, bears the burden of establishing that. Uh, so, so in terms of variances, a... Um, Precedent is not something that I'm overly concerned about. Now, I will say that uh, could someone introduce evidence to say, hey, similar to this property for which you already granted a variance, I have a similar issue and therefore I should have a variance as well. They can certainly present that as evidence, absolutely. But is it a per se, okay, we have to grant it now? No because you've got to look at all the factors just like you did for that first property. Thank you. So I wanna throw one example out and I know we got to quit because it's about 15 minutes before, but you know, let's just say that I own a property on the front part of it, it's pretty flat and kind of nice. On the back part, it's a cliff, okay? I want to put in an ice rink because I love to play hockey. Um, I would put it on the back if I could, but there's a cliff there. Can't do it. So the only place that I can really put that hockey arena or ice rink is in the front. And so I'm going to need a variance, you know, on the setback because, because I just need that to, to make a hockey rink. Okay. So the property, the nature of the property is there's only really one spot where I could put up. A, a, a hockey rink in. So it seems to me, so, so I'm asking the question, you know, is the practical difficulty just because there's a cliff on the one side and there's flat in the front that therefore we should consider that? Or, you know, the other option is, sorry, you just can't put a ho hockey rink in, just too bad. Well, I would start with the statement, your initial statement, which is, I want to have a hockey rink. Remember that it is based upon the unique nature of the property, not conditions personal to the owner. And just be, and again, there's a whole lot of factors to consider there. One is what's the property currently, be, what's it being used for? Is it a home that someone wants to put a hockey rink on? Okay. Uh, then we've got all the other factors to consider such as, all right, are those conditional uses or permitted uses? I think uh, that would fall into the outdoor gaming facility. Uh, requirement, which is a conditional use permit. Um, and now we're saying, all right, we want a conditional use permit and we want a variance because we can't meet the setback requirements. Uh, I would say, you know, it, it's hard for me to say yes or no, because again, you got to look at everything, right? Is the property so unique that all of these things, you know, would it destroy the character of the area? I, I mean, there's, there's something to be said that putting a hockey rink in, the, in your front yard might 
have a negative impact on the aesthetics of the neighborhood, right? Yeah, um, unless I guess if you live in Canada, they'd probably view that as a good thing. But what? but I guess I guess my point my point there is in almost every variance request that we hear, you know, my initial statement was I want to, in this case, I say put in a hockey rink. Uh, you know, it, it's, I want to put up a barn. I want to make a bigger basketball court. I want, you know, I mean, almost everything we hear is somebody wants to do something with their property, you know, that is going to require a setback change or natural resource. So it, it it's almost always that. So anyway, I, I'm going to stop because I, I know there's no hard and fast things, but, but anyway, just any guidance again, that you can provide is, is great. Are there any other questions for Mr. Young? Going once, going twice. Hold on, I have one. <laughs> <laughs> so are all of these factors to consider uh, for what, whichever variants we're talking about, use or area variants, are they all to be weighted equally in the process? process of considering an application. Yeah, so the one thing about especially area variances, and I'll kind of stick with that one because that's going to be 99% of what we see here, is the courts have in fact said there are no, there's no definition of what a practical difficulty is. So the factors that I'm giving you are factors courts have considered, uh, and it does not necessarily, and it's not all together. It could be one or multiple of them. So um, in terms of them being weighted the same, it's not a matter of we have to hit each of the factors. It's are any of these factors relevant? You know, Could we apply any of the factors? They're more guideposts than they are hard and fast rules. Thank you, very helpful. So Mr. Chair, it's about 6.50. We have our meeting starting in about 10 minutes. So if there are no last questions of Mr. Young, I'd say mute your microphone and um, stop video so your screen goes blank and then we'll come back to this meeting in about 10 minutes. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Arnie, for taking the reins tonight. I appreciate it. No problem, no problem. This is Travis.
Mr. Sprunger, thanks for taking charge tonight. No problem. I'll uh, do my best. You all are great in helping uh, get through these things. So uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll do fine. I'm, I have utmost confidence in you, so I'm not even concerned about that. So <laughs> and my appreciation, like I say, sometimes you wake up in the morning, and you think, oh, I got a pretty normal day. And then somebody yeah. throws something at you. Yeah. Well, I will confess when Robin said, hey, did you read your email? I'm like, well, no, I didn't. And there was a little Christmas gift early. <laughs> no problem. No, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. We try to hide those things. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, uh, that's okay. Right. Sometimes those are the best, right? Right at the very end when, when you get them. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's easier. It's harder to say no on zoom when everybody's watching you than you call us four hours ago and say, well, <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I, I really don't mind at all. If, if there's anything I can do to help, I, I'm more than happy to do it. So, yeah, great. Yeah, that was kind of interesting. Um, I, I know we're not being recorded or anything, but John, yeah, yeah. John's presentation was, was good. It, um, it certainly um, brought to light certain things that, um, you know, I'm a computer guy, so I, I deal in the world of ones and zeros. And so it's nice when you have really concrete stuff and, right. and uh, when it's, when it's a little gray or fuzzy, it's a, it's a lot tougher to deal with, but, uh, um, but it was helpful. It was helpful. Well, that's why when like now Robin and I, we like to talk about, for your example, the ice skating rink. You know, in terms of granting a variance, if they're supposed to be done sparingly and under the most undue circumstances, that works well if you have a lot and you can't build your dwelling on it, which is the intended and primary purpose. Right. It may not work as well for an ice skating rink just because you know, again, it will get you your home on your lot because that's what it that's the primary purpose. But on the flip side, if it's just because your home is on the lot and you know the lot is you've taken up much of your lot with things that you want, it may not be as a high a priority then to proceed forward with the consideration of a variance for an ice skating rink in the front yard. It's also why we look at impacts. That's part of what John kind of alluded to as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, is this going to be out of character with the neighborhood? Does uh, Do others have accessory structures or buildings in their front yard setback? If they don't, and this is the first one, it doesn't bode well. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we try to cover the bases for you, but as John mentioned, it takes five of you to know what's best, not just the Department of Planning. Sure, yeah. Well, we you know, I, I know we do rely a lot on, on y'all's judgment because, you know, we're, we're here and then we're gone, you know, after a number of years. And, and there's been a lot of consistency, of course, with yourself and, and others in the department. But um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's just never easy to sort these things out. But anyway. Well, I've, I've always uh, trusted in the five board members and when you drive around and you look at the variances that have been granted for whatever set of reasons or findings of fact, I think it's always turned out very, very well. So Good. congratulations to y'all. Hey, Joe, I, I was missed the first, first part of this, but did uh, John go into the reason why they're there to begin with is that they had been turned down by planning department or planning and zoning commission and so other people have reviewed this. It's not just this body, you know, acting. Um, there are probably multiple recommendations against something before they would appeal it to come to this board. Yes, Mr. Young kind of talked about what triggers an application and it's usually a, a, an interpretation or as you say, said somebody saying no because the code wouldn't allow it. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Springer, I have seven o'clock. We are recording. Um, Mr. Newberry is here to save us on YouTube. So I'm going to ask him to go ahead and start the YouTube video. If you'll give us just a second, 
before you call the meeting to order. Courtney, thanks for being here. I know you're doing the extra yard here because of your internet situation. According to Mr. Newberry, we are now streaming live on YouTube. So my thanks to him and he's going to depart. So if you'd like to call the meeting the order and read the script, we can get started. All right, I will do that. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, this evening is our monthly meeting of the Board of Adjustment. Uh, while we are having to change how we operate, we are still committed to a transparent process and encouragement of public comment during our meetings. We will be accepting public comments based on using the hand raise feature. You can raise your hand at any time and we will recognize you as we get to the public participation portion of uh, the agenda of, for each case. Uh, Director of Planning, Joe Vunich, will be moderating or is, is that correct or is it going to be Mr. Newberry? Mr. Newberry went on to his evening's activities, so it'll be Robin or I or both. So hopefully between the two of us or the one of us will be okay. Thank you. All right, very good. So uh, they will be uh, moderating the, uh, the meeting and will be asked to provide names of those individuals that wish to speak, again, as hands are raised. So with that being said, I would like to call the meeting of the City of Wildwood's Board of Adjustment to order. The board members present today are Deborah Coleman, board member, Bob Morris, board member, Michael Lee, alternate member, and Jim, and I am so sorry, I don't want to mess up your last name, is it? It's Rubis, the H is silent. The H is silent. I'm going to put a little note right here. Okay. Jim Rubis, alternate member, and myself, Arnie Sprunger, board member and acting chair for tonight's meeting. The Department of Planning staff present is Mr. Joe Vunich, Director of Planning, and Robin Keith, Planner, City Administrator Steve Cross, City Attorney John Young, and Court Reporter Courtney Tallman are also present. First, I offer into the record the affidavit of publication from, pertaining to today's meeting, September 16th, 2021 and take official notice of the zoning ordinance of City of Wildwood, including chapter 400, article two, authorizing and establishing the Board of Adjustments powers and duties. Now, let me explain the hearing procedure. Please be aware the information I'm about to describe is also provided on the Board of Adjustment public hearing procedure handout which was available online prior and up to tonight's meeting. This hearing is informal in its nature. However, the meeting's proceedings will be recorded by a reporter for future transcription if needed. The petitions are called in the order listed on the agenda. As the petition is called, I will ask a Department of Planning staff member to read each request into the record. Thereafter, the Department of Planning will have opening remarks and a brief slide presentation. Then the petitioner or his or her representative will be asked to state their name and address, be sworn in by the court reporter and make a brief presentation to the board explaining the nature of the requested variance and the hardship necessitating it. The board will only consider the nature and condition of the property and whether these factors mandate a variance in order to allow for its full utilization. Board members may ask questions to clarify the facts of the petitioner's presentation. When the board is satisfied with the material presented by the petitioner, the chair will then ask if there is anyone present online who would like to speak in favor or opposition to the request. Each speaker will be asked to provide their name and address, be sworn in, and then state their comments. Procedurally, the petitioner may request a continuance at any time during the hearing prior to a call for the vote in order to bring in additional documentation or information. The board may also request a continuance to gather additional information or for a further visit to the site. After the conclusion of input from all interested parties, the board will ask a staff person to provide 
the Department of Planning's report on this matter, if requested by any member of the board, the petitioner, or any individual that is participating online. Additionally, any other information not presented in the previous testimony, but pertinent to the request will be noted at this time. Once all speakers have been heard, the chair will call for a motion to grant or deny with or without conditions, then the board will vote. At that time, the discussion relating to the petition is concluded and no further input will be permitted. The board will generally make a decision today. Four members of the board must vote in favor of the petition for it to be approved. If a variance is approved, the petitioner has six months to obtain the necessary permits or establish the use or it will expire. If the board's decision is unfavorable, the petitioner has the right of appeal to the St. Louis County Circuit Court. This appeal must be done within 30 days of the decision. Okay, uh, Mr. Vunich, are there any questions at this time? Mr. Chair, I'll ask those in attendance at tonight's meeting, the two individuals, if you have any questions relating to the information provided by the chair as part of the introduction, if you would use the raise hand feature, I'd be glad to promote you to a panelist so you could ask those questions. Mr. Chair, neither of the attendees have raised their hand, so I think we can begin with the first case tonight. Okay, well, that being the case, uh, we will proceed. And so please read the first request into the record, which will be followed by initial comments by the Department of Planning and a brief slide presentation. So Mr. Vunich, take it away. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair and members of the board, the first case is BA 21-21, John and Carmen Rawls, 237 Clayton Oaks Drive, Ellisville, Missouri 63011. Request an exception to the minimum yard requirements general for the purpose of constructing a single family dwelling upon the property located at 315 Sice Lane, locator number 19W420026, which would thereby authorize a side yard setback distance of 20.5 feet in lieu of the required 30 foot standard on the southern side of it. The request is contrary to the requirements of Chapter 415.090 NU Non-Urban Resident District Regulations of the City of Wildwoods Zoning Ordinance. This particular property is located in Ward 1. And Mr. Chair, with your permission, before having Ms. Keefe narrate the slide presentation, the Department of Planning would like to introduce into the record the following items. Chapter 400, Article 2 of the City of Wildwood Municipal Code, the Board of Adjustment, Duties, Authorities, and Powers. Chapter 415 of the same City of Wildwood Municipal Code, the Zoning Ordinance. The file that has been developed and maintained by the Department of Planning on this particular request and all contents contained therein, including the department's report with recommendation. And then finally, any testimony evidence or other items offered at tonight's hearing regarding this matter. Mr. Chair, with your permission, I believe Ms. Keefe will share screen and then narrate the slide she's prepared. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Cannot hear you, Robin? Hmm. I don't know if it's me or if it's something else, but I certainly can't hear you. She's still on mute from where I'm sitting. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and good evening to all. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can, Robin. Can you hear us? We can hear you, Robin. Okay, I'm sorry. In attempting to unmute myself, I unmuted my keyboard um, or the computer. Well, thank you and good evening. Our first case this evening 
is a request to authorize a side yard setback of 20.5 feet in lieu of 30 feet for the purpose of constructing a new single family dwelling. The subject site is generally located in Northern Wildwood at the intersection of Highway 109 and Wild Horse Creek Road. They are both state maintained highways. Specifically, the subject uh, parcel has frontage on Sice Lane, which is a gravel uh, ribbon style road uh, that dead ends uh, shortly thereafter and um, also has frontage on Highway 109 uh, in the rear. That's on mute, right? Yes. Uh, the property does have some unique characteristic to it in that it has a substantial slope, um, including some steep grading in various areas of the lot. Uh, the overall relief on the property is 45 feet. This is a view of the property looking to the west. And this is a property looking to the southwest. This is a view to the northwest, uh, which includes a neighboring property. And this is a view of the ribbon style gravel road that is Sice Lane. And you can actually see the terminus um, at the end there. This is looking south. And this is looking north. Um, again, this is Sice Lane. And there are some neighboring properties. This is a view across the street to the east. And this is a view from across the street, but looking north. This is a view of uh, the side that would be most impacted by the variance um, along the southern edge of the property. And some of this uh, wooded area would be part of that. This is the terminus of Sice Lane. And this is a view uh, to the west uh, where the property starts becoming heavily wooded. And this is a view um, looking to the northwest at the front of the property. And this view is to give you an idea of some of the slope uh, that is experienced on the lot. Uh, this is looking southeast. And then finally, this is just looking to the south along that wooded edge uh, that begins um, mid property or mid lot. This is a view of the proposed site plan. I'm just going to zoom in here a little bit. Uh, these green lines represent the legal uh, setback for the non urban residence district that's at 30 feet. And this orange line represents the requested setback at 20.5 feet. Uh, this is the proposed driveway uh, coming into a side entry three car garage. And this would be the residence. It is important to note uh, that in several places around the residence and influencing uh, the, the layout is a 20% grade. Mm -hmm. And that concludes my presentation. Director Vunich and I are here if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And uh, before I call the petitioner forward, uh, are there any questions for either Mr. Vunich or Robin uh, before we have the petitioner come forward? Okay, doesn't look like there are. So um, I'd like to invite our petitioner to 
um, come forward and make sure that you state your name, your address, your relation to the property, and then remember, be sworn in by the court uh, uh, re reporter. John Rowles, 237 Clayton Oak Street, Ellisville, Missouri, owner of the property. Courtney, you're muted. Sorry. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rawls. Um, would you uh, please uh, share with us or explain the nature of the request and the hardship or practical difficulty necessitating your requested variance? And remember to relate to the character of the property. The property, it's a narrow lot and having to put a well Uh, you you accidentally either went completely away or you got muted there. Okay. I'm sorry. Having to put a well and a septic system on the property um, in accordance with the distance between each of them and a driveway is where I'm running into the issue. I am four feet over from the plan that I drew on the property. Okay. Okay, and on the back side, uh, MoDOT is taking ten feet of the property for the roundabout that's supposed to come on 109 in Wild Horse. So it's kind of shrinking me up. Okay. Okay. That's kind of a bummer. All right. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add? No, that's it. That's it. Okay. Are there any questions then for the petitioner? Okay, I don't see any questions from any of the board members. Um, I'd like Chairman, this point. Oh, go ahead. Uh, is there any, uh, the property that's adjacent to you to the south, is, is there any structures or uh, residents on that piece of property? Uh, it's woods to the south or the, down the size lane is a residence down there on three to the acres left. to the left, which I've spoke uh, with uh, John on it and told him that I'd be what I'm asking for. And he's in favor of it as long as I am moving into the residence, which I am, I'm not going to be renting. Okay. And, and the, the, the piece of property that's adjacent, is that owned? I assume it's owned by somebody that they're renting. Yes, it is owned. It is a renter in there, the one to the right of the property. Yeah, to, to the, the south. Point. That's well, correct. Okay. To the south is not. South is the, the, the south. property to the south is owned by John. Oh that okay. I'm going and to be pushing up again. And that's, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's all I have. To, to clarify, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the property the property adjacent and directly to the south is an almost 10 acre wooded property uh, that I believe is vacant. Uh, the neighbor that they're talking about to the south is across Sice Lane uh, from them and not directly adjacent. Oh, across size lane. Okay, that, that would be kind of southeast then, would it be, I guess? Yes, yeah. I, I would describe it as yeah. at a corner on that yeah. south, uh, southeastern corner. Got it, okay. All Mr. right, thank Chair. you. Mr. Chair, if you'd like, Ms. Keefe could share screen and kind of give you a visual of the parcel layout. Yeah, that would be great. Please do. Unmute first and
Okay, so I'm just going to go back up to the aerial so you can see this property is the one to the south. That's the 10 acre one, right? That's, yeah, that's nearly 10 acres. Yeah, okay. And this was the neighbor that I, they were talking about to the southeast. And then these are the renters to the north. Okay, great. Okay, are there any other questions for either the petitioner or for uh, Joe or Robin? Okay, thank you, Mr. Rawls. Um, at this time, we'll open the floor to speakers in the audience who may want to speak either in favor or opposition uh, to the request. Are there any uh, individuals that would like to speak? Mr. Chair, if you'd give me a second, I'll ask Mr. Rademeyer if he'd like to speak on this particular request. If he would like to speak, he, if he would not mind raising his hand, using that raise hand feature, I'd be glad to promote him. He has chatted, that's in, sent to chat and says, no, he does not have any comments. So Mr. Chair, there is no other public comment. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, at this point then, um, I would like to offer an opportunity to hear an oral presentation of the department's report. Would anyone like to hear that? Okay, uh, since I don't see any desire for that, um, I would then offer the Department of Planning the opportunity to make any final comments on this variance request. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll handle that. Okay. Um, <laughs> the department in this case is recommending a favorable action. Um, as noted, the property has some unique characteristics. It is a substandard lot for the non-urban residence district. It's about a third of the three acre minimum size. Um, it is also a very narrow lot that further restricts um, the building area um, in terms of setback, uh, particularly given that it is in the non-urban residence district. Um, but furthermore, and perhaps most relevant, uh, there is some pretty steep grading on several um, areas of the lot uh, that further uh, limit um, the area in which uh, they can build. Uh, in addition, um, we know that with the southern neighbor uh, being a 10 acre vacant property and heavily wooded, um, it is not likely to uh, have much of an impact there. And uh, that concludes our, our recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so at this point, are there any final questions or comments by the board uh, before we close this portion and proceed to a vote. Any questions or comments? I do not see any. So therefore we will close the proceeding now and we will uh, take a vote. And so I'd like to call for a vote, either a motion to approve, deny or approve with conditions. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Okay, we have a motion to make the motion to approve. There we go. Okay, so we have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? A second. Okay, we have a sec. Okay, thank you. We have a second. And so now it is time for a roll call. Uh, Ms. Coleman, how do you vote? Approve. Okay, Mr. Ruiz, how do you vote? Approve. Okay. Mr. Lee, how do you vote? Approve. Thank you. And I also uh, vote to approve. So congratulations, your variance is granted. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That. Uh, 
concludes this uh, petition. And so I think we're ready to move on to our second and I believe our final petition for the yes. night. So if uh, you would uh, like to, or Joe or whoever would like to read it into uh, the record, let's go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have a request of Ms. Keefe. Could you see if Mr. Morris has bumped off the call? Yeah, not on the screen at this time. Yeah. No, no, no. Thank you for your patience. The second and final request tonight for the Board of Adjustment is BA 22-21, Tony Rademeyer, 17808, Suzanne Ridge Drive, Wildwood, Missouri, 63038. Request exceptions to the regulations governing outdoor game courts, which prohibit any lighting of them within the R resident district designated property located within the city of Wildwood and a rear yard setback distance of one foot in lieu of 15 feet. The petitioners have an existing light standard in association with their outdoor game court that is installed upon the property at 17808 Suzanne Ridge Drive, locator number 21V430362 Oak Ridge Trails Subdivision, Lot 82, and seek to retain it. The request is contrary to the requirements of Chapter 415.110 R11 Acre Resident District Regulations of the City of Wildwood Zoning Ordinance for Outdoor Game Courts and St. Louis County Planned Environment Unit District Ordinance Number 17648, approved by the St. Louis County Council on July 14, 1995. This particular property is located in Ward 3. Also, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I would like to introduce into tonight's record the following items. Chapter 400, Article 2 of the City of Wildwood Municipal Code, the Board of Adjustment. Chapter 415 of the same City of Wildwood Municipal Code, the Zoning Ordinance. The file that has been developed and maintained by the Department of Planning regarding this particular request and all contents contained therein, including the Department of Planning's report with recommendation. And then finally, any evidence, testimony, or other items offered as part of tonight's hearing. Mr. Chair, I believe Ms. Keefe is probably still trying to get Mr. Morris online and into the meeting. So with your permission, I am going to... Um, Stop my video, and I'm going to walk up. Oh, there she is. Oh, there oh, she there's is. Mr. Morris. Mr. Morris. <laughs> We're just going to go ahead and share a screen, if that's all right with everybody. All right. Sure. Well, I, with your permission, Mr. Chair, I believe Mr. Keefe, in tow with Mr. Morris, I have a slide presentation. They can begin now. Thank you. Okay. Please proceed. All right. All right, everyone, uh, our second case of the evening should look familiar to you, uh, but first, can everyone hear me? Great. Yeah. Uh, in June of this year, the Board of Adjustment uh, did see another application uh, for this property uh, where the applicant was granted a rear setback distance of one foot, one foot <laughs> in lieu of 15 feet uh, to repair an existing retaining wall uh, that was in existence prior to the purchase of the property. Uh, the retaining wall supports the existence of a sport court, and tonight their request is a setback of one foot in lieu of 15 feet to retain this sport court, and also an exception to the regulations governing sport courts in our residence district in order to retain their existing light standard on the court. So with that, the general location of the property, uh, you can see in this aerial is along, uh, is in Northern Wildwood uh, to the east of Highway 109. And uh, this is in a planned environment unit, uh, which is 
which was approved by St. Louis County. It allows uh, cluster development around common areas, uh, which you can see in here, this is a 6.1 acre common area of ground. And this is the subject property here. And you can see the sport court um, at the rear of the property. Uh, the property is located on a cul-de-sac, uh, Suzanne Ridge Drive, uh, which terminates here. Uh, this is the front of the residence looking to the east. Uh, it is in Oak Ridge Trails subdivision. Uh, this is a view to the south. And this is a view of the cul-de-sac to the north. And here you can see the two neighbors on either side of the subject, um, subject property. Uh, this is the northern side um, going east and maybe slightly north. Um, and here you can see the sport court at the back of the property. Uh, this is the other side of the residence uh, to the south. And there you see the sport court coming from that perspective. This area back here is all common ground. And this is the retaining wall that was the subject of the last request. And this is the uh, survey of the property with the sport court um, and setback lines. And this is the uh, current uh, light fixture on the property uh, that lights up their gameplay at night. Uh, this is a close up view to give you some idea of the shielding around the lighting. Uh, this is a view of uh, the uh, view to the north. And this is a view to the south to give you an idea of the surrounding area. And then again, this is common ground uh, to the rear of the court. Uh, the two neighbors are in favor of the variance request um, here tonight. And that uh, concludes my presentation. Dire uh, Director Vunich and I are here if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, and again, before um, I call the petitioner forward, are there any questions or comments from any of the board members? Uh, Ms. Coleman, are you wrestling with your computer? Are there, you okay? I got it. I got was it. just okay. I had a question on that lighting. Uh, she said shaded lighting. So does that mean the light is all um, kind of made to go downward and not spread um, like a street light would? Is this a special type of light? Do you well, understand what I mean? Yeah. Just, yeah, I think we get your it's question. Shaded so it only shines down. Is that, that was my question. Sure, and I don't know if it's best answered by the Department Might. of Planning or maybe the petitioner. If the department wants to venture a response, that's great. Otherwise, we'll wait for the petitioner. Okay, it might be a premature question. Thank no, you. No, it's a good question. It's a fair question. Uh, does the department want to answer or do you want to defer to the uh, petitioner? Uh, Mr. Chair, the, the, the lighting is fully shielded, which is a requirement of our outdoor lighting requirements. Okay. And Ms. Colvin, you've described it very accurately. Fully shielded lighting directs all of the illumination down and not okay. out. And so okay. it, it actually is a compliant light standard. And we were very pleased with that when we um, visited the site and took the photographs. Thank you, Mr. Vunich. Any other questions for the department at this time? If not, okay. Um, I, I'd like to invite um, the Rademeyers to come forward and 
Remember to state your name, your address, your relation to the property, and then remember, be sworn in by the court reporter, okay? Sounds great. Uh, I'm Tony Rademeyer. I'm Debbie Rademeyer. Uh, we live at uh, 17808 Suzanne Ridge Drive, Wildwood, Missouri, 63038, and we are both the owners of the residence. Perfect, and now let's get you sworn in by the court reporter. Courtney? Please raise your hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. All right, thank you. And at this time, if uh, either one of you would like to take the lead and explain the nature of the request and the hardship or practical difficulty necessitating the variance, uh, we would very much appreciate that. Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, we uh, purchased this house. So we closed on it in August of 2015. And um, when we purchased the property, you know, we were assuming that all of the <laughs> regulations were being met um, on the sport port. As you can see, it was put in professionally installed. So we didn't think that were, there were any issues. Um, as you can see in the pictures, we're actually having some work done around the court to secure um, the wall that's behind it. And so um, really the hardship is, is that we've, we've had this in since the beginning. And um, I think if you were to attest to our neighbors, we don't abuse the, the lighting of it, <laughs> such as leaving it on all night or, um, you know, causing a nuisance to the neighborhood. And as uh, Joe mentioned as well, um, they do face downward. So it's not, um, it's not a major distraction. Um, you know, you can obviously see if a light is on um, to be candid, but it's not a, a major um, nuisance um, to the neighborhood, mainly because it's uh, blocked significantly by the, by the common ground and the trees that are around it as well. And it is um, on a switch and the switch is pretty far from the light. It's, um, on our house under the deck. So even if somebody were to trespass on our property, they probably wouldn't know where the switch was to turn it on. <laughs> okay. All right, well, there you go. Um, okay, thank you for that. So at this time, unless you have something additional to add, we'll open this up to questions by any of the board members. Um, I actually have one. I just wanna make sure that, that I'm clear on this. It, the light's been there for a while, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, we, I don't have the exact date when this sport port was installed. I'm, I think it's around 2010. 2010. Yeah, oh, 2008. Two, yeah, I think. she knows, I guess. I think when we did the research initially, I think um, who did I work with? Steve Boyd. Is that um, initially when we had to go through this the first time? I think if they found it back in 2008, um, that it was built sometime that year. So we assume that the light went in at the same time. We're not sure, um, but it's, the light's been there since we purchased the house in 2015. Okay, so we know for sure since 2015. Mm -hmm. And so help me understand, um, are you here just to, I mean, the light's been there. So <laughs> help the me problem, understand why we're here, yeah. Okay, so we, um, went through all the, whatever you're supposed to do, we needed to get a variance for two. Um, the, the retaining wall behind the sport port was failing. Right. Right. It was a safety issue. So we had initially requested to get variance for the retaining wall so we could fix it. Um, we got through board of adjustment hearing, we went to planning and zoning. Um, and during one of those meetings, it was noticed that there was a light um, on the sport port. So it came up during one of those meetings that we should probably have that address, which is why we're, we, we got we got all the permits we need to do the retaining wall. And then we were going back to see if we can maintain the light. Joe, are we, are we saying that correctly or? Mr. Chair, if I may. Please. Um, for many years now, the city of Wildwood has, uh, has had regulations relating to outdoor game courts. Mm -hmm. Those regulations specify that game courts can be lit in the NU non-urban resident district, but not in any of the R districts, which is the case here with the Rademeyer's lot. 
Unfortunately, the Department of Planning, i.e. the director, missed the fact that the light standard was in place when the Board of Adjustment considered the request for the retaining wall and its repair. But the light standard was discovered when the Planning and Zoning Commission was asked to review the site development plan and authorize the game court based upon the criteria they use. Mr. Lee at the time was a participant in that. And the Planning and Zoning Commission approved the site development plan, but they cannot alter the regulations as was described to you tonight by John Young, meaning it prohibits lighting in the R district. So the only option is to come to the Board of Adjustment. And again, the Rademeyers have gone through now, I believe three steps to get to this point and certainly have been patient and have asked have responded to everything we've asked them to do in this regard. And Thank just you. one other note, we did not know that there was um, an issue with the light when we initially went to get the permits to re repair the retaining wall. So we weren't trying to, you know, not address the light situation. We just didn't know that there was an issue with it. Right. And, and so, and so what we're doing at this juncture is kind of cleaning things up and making them all proper and so forth. It's, okay, exactly. that's okay. That's that's what I thought maybe was going on. Okay, great. That's helpful. That's helpful. Well, and I yeah, applaud I mean, your your patience and your persistence. Um, yeah, Joe's been really great to work with. He'll be sad to see us go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, but we at the end of the day, like you mentioned, um, Chairman, we that's what we want is if we want to make sure that everything is properly documented for resale down the road of our property. We don't want this, a new owner to ever inherit something that, you know, we assumed it was fine. And I guess we learned our lesson, which is, you know, I'm not gonna cry over spilled milk, but we just wanna make sure we're doing the right thing going forward and that you guys are aware of everything that we're doing and you're, you know, and it's approved through the city. Thank you, Mr. Rademeyer. We, we applaud your desire to, um, to be, compliant or at least do the process to uh, to take care of these things. That's great. Okay, are there any other questions from any of the board members for either the department or the Rademeyers? Yeah, Jim, or Mr. Rubies. Uh, Mr. Rademeyer, the, uh, just so I understand, the variance that we're going for tonight is to give the variance for the light. Has, has the sports court been approved by the zoning, planning and zoning? Yes. And Mr. Chair, with your permission, when the department prepared the advertisement for the retaining wall, which was heard by the Board of Adjustment, it was inferred that the outdoor game court was part of that variance. The inference may not have been as clear as one would want, and following the Rademeyer's desire, the department didn't want to have to, didn't want them to have to come back and argue that, yes, it was inferred. So tonight, just to cover all the bases, the department placed the outdoor game court as part of the request as well. Now, the Planning and Zoning Commission saw the design as it was presented and built, and they approved it, Mr. Rubis. Thank you. And the other question I have is, has the uh, Homeowners Association uh, adjudicated either one way or the other? They signed off um, on this entire project. They were aware of what exists, current state, and what we are proposing. And, and that has been, that when you say, Mr. Rademeyer, that it was signed off on, it was that like in a letter or something that was presented to the department? It was a, it was a form that Steve, I, 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 Steve from Wild City of Wildwood sent me that I had to have both of our, I think it was the one I had to have both of our neighbors sign mm -hmm. to each side of us. And then the homeowners, uh, the trustees signed it as well. And then we, we forwarded that on. I think that was in the paperwork for the original Board of Adjustments meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Chair, the Planning and Zoning Commission received that information as well. Okay, good, good. Okay, so that, 
that base has been covered. That's good. Are there any other questions uh, then of the remaining board members? If not, I don't see that there are any. Uh, why don't we go ahead and open the floor to any speakers in the audience who may want to uh, speak in favor or opposition to the request. Are there any speakers? Mr. Chair, there are no attendees at this particular hearing tonight, so there is no public comment. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, and at this point, I will offer the opportunity to hear an oral presentation of the department's report. If anyone would so desire, and since I don't see anyone asking for that, then I will offer to the department of planning the opportunity to make any final comments. Mr. Chair, thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the board, the Rademeyers are being kind when they say they weren't trying to hide the light standard from anybody. That was something that the director of planning should have saw when he visited the property and obviously missed it. So it's a mistake the department made, not the Rademeyers. So I wanna make that clear. And I do want to acknowledge as part of the record for this hearing, their cooperation over the course of many months now, and then again, doing what we've asked and following through on the process and the steps associated with it. Mr. Chair and members of the board, the department is supporting the request. The support is not just based on the fact that the outdoor game court is existing, but if you follow the photographs that Ms. Keefe provided, there is a substantial slope associated with the particular lot in question. That slope begins at the rear of the dwelling and then trends to the east into the common ground area. Logically, the location of the outdoor game court is premised on the characteristics of the property. And again, in weighing the benefit of denying the variance and having the game court removed and the light standard that's associated with it versus the benefits of retaining it, particularly knowing that it has no impact on the neighbors, the neighbor to the east, the common ground area, and both of the neighbors on either side have supported it. The department is recommending approval of the variance by the Board of Adjustment. The department, Ms. Keefe and I are available for any comments or questions along with the city administrator, Scott, um, Steve Cross. And thank you for your attention. And the department's concluded its short comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vunich, uh, for that. Um, so at this time, I would like to offer the board any final comments or opportunity for any final comments or questions before we proceed. Uh, to a vote. Any other questions, comments? Okay, I don't see any. So uh, we're going to go ahead and close this uh, part of the meeting, this proceeding, and we are going to ask for a vote. At this point, I'd like to call for a vote, either a motion to approve, deny, or approve with conditions. Do I have a motion from someone? I will make Three. a motion. I'll make a motion to approve BA 22-21 with the site-specific criteria. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Do we have a second? Mr. Rubies, I see your hand waving. And if you unmute, I will love to hear your I voice. Second. I second. All right. Thank you, sir. And at this time, we are going to take a roll call vote. And Mr. Morris, we're going to give you the opportunity to lead this off. How do you vote? Approve. You approve. Mr. Lee, how do you vote? Approve. Mr. Rubies, how do you approve? I mean, vote? Approve. Sorry. Uh, Ms. Coleman, how do you vote? Approve. And I likewise approve. And so congratulations, Mr. and Mrs. Rademeyer. Your variance request is approved as requested. And I trust this may be the last time we see you for a while. <laughs> well, so. we, we gotta put it, we gotta replace the deck on our house. So you never know. You never know, right? <laughs> thank you well, so much for, you. for voting and in, in our favor. We really appreciate it. We appreciate all your time. Thank you, Joe. 
All right. Well, you're welcome and, and best wishes to you all as you uh, continue to exercise out on your sport court. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night. Okay. Good night. Okay. At this point, I think that is the last uh, petition that we are going to hear. So I think I would like to uh, call this meeting to closure. And uh, I don't know that there's anything else that we need to take care of. Mr. Chair, there's not. I just want to extend my thanks to John Young for his presentation. I thought it was yeah. very well done. Mm -hmm. And Good. to Ms. Tallman for kind of finding a way to get internet and participate tonight. We do appreciate it. And to Robin and Mr. Cross to your attendance as well. And to all the board members, as I always say, we can't do it without you. So we appreciate it very much. And don't forget, next Saturday is Celebrate Wildwood. It starts, yeah. at 11. it starts at 10 o'clock with a parade. And then from 11 to about 9.15 in the evening, we'll be here with a lot to do. So we hope to see you all here. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you for that, uh, that plug for the city. It's always good to, <laughs> to be reminded. <laughs> yeah, the city does a great job with those things. Mm -hmm. And we, we thank you for doing that. So, okay. So at this point, I bid you all farewell. And until we see each other again, good night. Good night. Hi.